Heavenly Father, as we kneel before your throne and thanking you for your Son, Jesus Christ, thanking you for what you've done already for us, thanking you for the eternal sacrifice that you made in becoming human, to be made like one of us, considering what you were, and one day soon we'll find out face to face what that really is. But Lord, we want to find that out, but there are many things that could block our way and uh, some of these things we've chosen to bring into our own homes. And so, Lord, today, as we share about these things, I would ask in your name that you would please bless us with your Holy Spirit, bless us with the courage that comes from having your Spirit. And I, I ask for you to help me with your word this morning. Anoint my lips, anoint our ears, and give us again the courage to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I had trouble coming up with uh, the title for this, but I think I, I'm going to call it Mystic Babylon, Mother of Inventions. Um, you know, people say that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, well, we're going to find out some things. Maybe you already knew some of them, uh, but maybe you haven't applied these things all together. And uh, I find it quite interesting. But what I'd like to do is uh, start with some principles. Our opening text this morning is found in Romans chapter 1, verses 30 through 32, and I used a bit of an abbreviated version of it, but if you'd get your Bibles out, you can see the whole thing, but I'll, for brevity, go along with this, and as you look at some of these pictures, don't look too long, but I was trying to find pictures that said what the text did, but in the last days... And Paul was speaking of them, even in his time, but it's even worse in our time, because evil men and seducers shall what? Get better and better? By evolution? No, we get worse and worse by devolution. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters. And this is the underlying thing I'd like you to remember. Inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Friends, there are many things that we would never do ourselves, but we are quite entertained watching other people do them on a video. Um, or on some other means of uh, video presentation. But um, maybe if we have time, I'll get into uh, neuro, mirrors. What is it called? Mirror neurons? Mirror neurons. Mirror neurons. Um, when Jesus says, uh, you have heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, when you look on a woman with lust, you've committed adultery with her already. There's things about what we look at that happen in our mind. Mirror neurons. It's as though we actually did it, and it's locked into our mind as though we've done it ourselves. So anyway, it's something that we need to look at when we think about uh, whether we're going to flip something on. And sometimes we do it prophylactically. Instead of going to a theater, we'll just buy a DVD. Well, I'd just like to discuss um, discovery and inventions and intentions. I'd like to look at two things this morning to start with, and we'll have to make this a two-part message. But uh, gold and money and uh, gunpowder, which when it was invented, it wasn't invented for guns, it was actually invented by an alchemist who was trying to find for the emperor a way to perpetuate life. And an alchemist today might be called a what? <laughs> a sorcerer, or a chemist, or a pharmacist. Okay, But that's what he was trying to do, and as he had a bunch of things out on a table, uh, uh, some of the ingredients, and it happened somewhere between 600 and 900 A.D. Um, there was a mix, there was some saltpeter, charcoal, and some other things that were there, and a spark flew off and landed on the table, and it caused a brilliant flash, an explosive flash that burnt the house down where they were working. Wow! The next time he tried it in his excitement, he heated the same compound up in an empty bamboo chute and a huge explosion, and thus was born the firecracker. Now, at first, they were using it for decoration, really, for every celebration. They thought, this is absolutely beautiful. When you see these sparks flying, light, fire, you know, 
I don't know about you, but Fourth of July, I, there's still an element of the kid in me that likes it. But anyway, they used it for celebrations, and actually they thought with the uh, firecrackers, they really got into those, and if you've been to China or the Orient and seen how they used them, they originally used them to ward off evil spirits. That was their thought. But then as they started seeing people getting hurt using the fireworks by accident, then they recognized, wow, if we use this right, we can hurt them even more on purpose. So is gunpowder in and of itself evil? No. It's about the intentions. It's what you plan to do with it. Because you can use gunpowder today, and they still do, explosives, to build uh, roads, to dig tunnels, to do mining, to dig up gold, <laughs> which we're going to look at in a minute. And even bullets have been used to preserve life. Now, most of us are vegetarians. But some people have stayed alive by using a bullet, a well-placed one in a deer or what have you, to stay alive. So again, a lot depends on your intention. So the invention wasn't evil in itself. But now let's look at money for a second. Now gold is as good as our intentions. Now when you think about, now we didn't invent gold, did we? No, we discovered it. Um, or we had it pointed out to us. Now, the biggest amount of it is in heaven, where it's used for drywall, uh, asphalt, <laughs> building material. It's one of the most common elements that you'll find in heaven. It's everywhere you look. But here on earth, it's not as common, but we do find it starting out well in the Bible in Genesis chapter 2. Let's read. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, it says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And what kind of gold, friends? Verse 12 says, And the gold of that land is what kind? Good. Good. So is gold evil? No. no. Gold isn't evil at all. But what you do with it, how you get it, what you want to control with it. You know, there was nothing wrong with it. It was used actually in decorating the, the panels. It was used in the sanctuary. There's nothing wrong with gold. Nothing at all. But again, it's the intentions. Not the invention in this case. But as we read 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10, we're just looking at some principles now. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the what? Love of money. So the money is not evil. The love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. As we look at what some people do with gold, you know, it's just to, uh, it's uh, self-aggrandizement. But of course, you know, uh, have you ever heard of the golden rule? He who has the gold makes the rules. So anyway, it's, uh, it's about your intentions. But now I'd like to move on to something we're a little more familiar with. In Revelation, you know, what does all this got to do with uh, the great controversy? You know, if we don't have an element of the great controversy in a message, it's probably not even truth that's worth discussing. But I want to tie it all together. What I want to look at this morning is the judgment of the great whore. But in Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 4 speaks of the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters uh, with whom the inhabitants of the earth have been made what? Drunk. When you are drunk, do you have your mind? Do you have your... No. Okay. So the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And the woman was decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And what did she have? A golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. What I want to do is, is look at modern channelers, how uh, modern medium and sorcery, the different things that she's got in this cup, and how many of us have inadvertently been partakers and made drunk on this. And I think it's slowing down us getting out of here. But let's look at this a little closer. Again, there's another text in Revelation, uh, speaking of Babylon, chapter 18, verse 23. 
it says, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And as we look up this word, this is something I'm all too familiar with. Uh, Strong's uh, 5331 and 3332, because the word comes from this one. But it's pharmakias, pharmacon, which is magic, medication, spell giving, potion, magician, sorcerer. By the way, um, the gunpowder, I, I forget the name of it, it'll come to me when it doesn't make any difference, but the Chinese word for it was uh, magic drug. Or um, something, it was uh, uh, something drug. Anyway, it'll come back to me in a minute, I'm sorry, it, it lost me. But again, when they started looking and found it, they were not looking for making explosives. They were looking for a drug that would make you last forever. But again, let's, uh, let's look at this. Now, what I'd like to do, when the judgment of the great whore takes place, what else is taking place? Who else is being judged? Everyone, aren't we? Okay, so what is that time that we're looking at? 1844. And by the way, uh, Babylon is a name. Does a name mean anything? Names mean something in the Bible. Names mean a lot in the Bible. Like when Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. From Jacob, a thief, supplanter, a crook, to an overcomer with God. Right? So Babylon, now remember, Satan's a counterfeiter. For every truth of God, Satan has at least one counterfeit. Sometimes multiple counterfeits. So Jesus is the word of God, and he gives you a sound mind and clear judgment, right? So what does Babylon do? The opposite. Babel, Babel. Where did it came from? Remember when the Lord scattered them. And it's a confusion of voices. So I want to tie this together, but this all begins to take place around the time when the Philadelphia church changes its name, or the Lord changes its name to Laodicea. Right? Is there any difference in the character? There sure is. And that's the reason why. And we are a people in judgment, by the way. Laodicea is a people judged. But there are some things going wrong in Laodicea, isn't there? Okay, and when we get the ice out and figure it out, we're going to be a whole lot better off. Okay, so now we're looking at the time period, uh, 1843 and 44, and the period of years that are leading up to it. There was a message that was coming from heaven to give the world a great awakening, to get them ready for the judgment. Isn't that right? Even as before the Day of Atonement, there was a sounding of trumpets for how many days? Ten days. So, this message started warming up and warning people that there is a judgment coming. And we need to be well aware of it ourselves. But again, uh, there was something else that started happening. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, and I believe it's the time of the end. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. What's the primary application of that text? What kind of knowledge? Spiritual knowledge. The primary, and that is the opening up of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, or especially the prophecies of Daniel, helping to further unfold the Revelation, and vice versa. But there is also an increased knowledge of technology that began to take place. And I believe a lot of that technology had no source from heaven. It's possible to use some things, but I'm beginning to think more and more it's maybe not the best thing to do. But what I'd like to do is look into some of the things that were taking place. God wanted to send a message to a dying world, and at that time the fastest way to send a message was how? On the back of a fast horse, right? But things were about to change in 1844. There is a man named Samuel Morris, and I think out of all the people that I'm going to talk about today and at the 11 o'clock hour, Samuel Morris is about the only godly one out of the bunch. Now, if you read the history of Samuel Morris, he was a strong uh, opponent of the actions of the Church of Rome. But he also brought a means of communication, rapid communication, didn't he? And, and it came with a... Tap, tap, tap. 
right? Telegram. Telegram, okay? So we see some things happening. Now, when Satan knows that a, a revival is going to take place, he being the student of prophecy that he is, what does he try to do? Counterfeit that revival. Confuse it. Confound it. Babel. Babylon, right? So out it comes. As the knowledge increases, as men are running to and fro to gain this knowledge, here it comes. Boom, the explosion. Right out of the pit. Okay? And so we see it taking place. Uh, Satan's counterfeits and his distractions. It started out, 1844. Mary Baker Eddy and the Christian scientists, right? The, the health message being convoluted and, and uh, excuse me, confounded. And then you had this man, Joseph Smith, okay? And a, a whole other church, a whole other remnant church started coming. And by the way, have you ever looked at their Bible, the one that they, they hand to you? Remember Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, when they hand you that book, and it says, another gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul said? If anyone bring to you any other gospel than the one that we preach to you, even an angel from heaven. And so Moroni comes, an angel from heaven, gives this gospel to Joseph Smith, and he comes and brings it to the world. Anyway, Satan's counterfeit. At that same time, Charles Darwin, Origin of Species, right? And to go along with it, Karl Marx came out with a book, Economic and uh, Philosophy, uh, Manuscript of 1844. So here was a, a political ideology to match Darwin's uh, Origin of Species. So everything is being lined up for a complete overthrow of what God is doing, a shutdown of the awakening, right? But it's not enough. You see, Jesus is the Word of God. He is the ultimate communicator. Isn't that true? And he wants his people to be ultimate communicators as well. But Satan says, I will be like the Most High. So he comes out with forms of communication himself. So what do we have happening? Now, in 1843-44, as I mentioned to you, there's a lot of different things started happening. The, the means and modes of transportation started happening. The steam engine came up. Pop, 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 or thug, thug, thug. You've heard those things before. But along with the tap, 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 come the pop, pop, and the chunk, chunk, and all these different noises. It was a noisy time. No wonder the message had to go with a loud voice to get over the things that were happening right around at that same time. So we see that uh, the modes of transportation started taking off. And this is the very first um, telegram that was sent. And what I find beautiful about it in this man here, Samuel Morse, what was the first thing that he said? What hath God wrought? And you know where his head was at. I really appreciate that about him. And as you read some of the things he wrote, <laughs> he was tough as nails. Um, but also you see the, the symbols that they used for the, the telegraph wires. An angel, a messenger running up the wires. So as these little tap, tap, tap started going around the world and the wires started going around the world and they even ran under the Atlantic, it wasn't very long, just a few years, Satan knew he had to do something. So matching up with the tap, tap, tap of the telegram, here comes Satan with his new religion called rap, rap, rap at the Fox sisters' house, right? You remember what was happening? Well, <clears throat> again, some of the pictures that I use, you may not, I really don't care for, but they do tell the story. Mr. Splitfoot, they started talking to this thing, and isn't it interesting they call him Mr. Splitfoot? Okay, um, I have to read a couple of notes just to make sure that I've got it. It was on March 31st, 1848, four years after, Things are starting to move in Hydesville, New York, in the home of Leah and Kate and Margaret Fox. And the rap, rap, rap sounded the entrance of a brand new religion. And this religion had for its cornerstone the original lie that caused the fall of man in the garden. And um, it was said that the person that they were speaking to with the was a man named Charles Rosma, who was a, a peddler who was murdered, and they later found, as they excavated uh, their house there, in between 
a second row of blocks for the foundation, they did find a skeleton of a man down under the house. Now, Satan, he always plants evidence to try to make it look even better, right? But when they were speaking to the dead, who were they speaking to? Straight line to the devil, right? But uh, they call him Mr. Splitfoot, and there's only one that I know of, Baphomet, that kind of looks like that, the uh, cloven foot thing. But anyway, um, let's look at the uh, tablet or the, uh, the plaque that they have outside. And here's the foundation of the Fox Sisters' house. Oh, by the way, the news of the Fox Sisters and the wrapping, it spread faster than the gospel did. It went around the world in lightning speed and everywhere. There were fakers and frauds, but there were also the real thing, spiritualist mediums. And things started happening beyond the wrapping, and they started happening really, really fast. But what it says on the plaque there, uh, it says, The cornerstone of modern spiritualist religion, spiritualist of the world, in commemoration of the advent, now notice that, the advent of modern spiritualism at Hydesville, New York, March 31st, 1848, in tribute to mediumship, media, medium, excuse me, I'm kind of telegraphing my, uh, my uh, middle part. Anyway, the rock upon which demonstrable spiritualism stands. What is it? There is no death. There are no dead. Now, what was it that Satan said originally? Thou shalt not surely die. Okay, so I'd just like to look at these things. Keep them tucked in your hat. And now we're going to go back a little bit to the passing of the time in 1844 after the rejection of the first angel's message. If you read early writings, page 55 and 56, um, I'm going to abbreviate it here, but please keep, uh, pay close attention to it. Now again, while this is going on, so is this. Before the throne, I saw the Advent people, the church, and the world. I saw two companies, one bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood uninterested and careless. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come, but few would receive this great light. Now remember, it came from the Father to the Son, and from the Son, he waved it over the people. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it, and immediately they did what? Resist. Resisted it. And it moved off from them. Some cherished it, and went down and bowed down with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it, and their countenances shone with its glory. There's going to be a repeat of that right towards the end. Remember how Moses' countenance shone with the glory? Ours is supposed to shine with reflection from the light of God. But now, what happened with the people that, that came out from under that light that rejected it? Watch this. I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose, and they were left in not just darkness, but perfect darkness. So even commentators from all the churches will tell you what happened. Shortly after the awakening, they will tell you that there was a period of spiritual declension that came into the churches that was just beyond anything that they could imagine. And the spirit of prophecy also speaks of it. But he knows they wouldn't receive the light. The rejection of the first angel's message brought forth the need for what? The second. Okay, and you know what? People are rejecting that message even today in our own church. But those around him... Those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, right? Wait here. I am going to my Father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to him in the holiest and pray, My Father, give us thy spirit. Then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In that breath there was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. We need to be praying that prayer today, don't we? Father. And we need to direct it to the second apartment. Amen. Amen? Amen. If you read Revelation 11, you see what happens to those that are in the courtyard. 
Moving on. I'll finish it up with this one. The company who were still bowed down before the throne did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. This, what I want to talk to you about this morning, is that breath. In it there was power and light. Now, this will have something, when I bring up the radiometer, you'll understand what I mean. Now, to us, all of spiritual, uh, excuse me, all of Christianity was susceptible to the, the wrappings and the spiritualism. Why? Because they refused, they reject texts like this, right? They believe there is no death, there are no dead, that everybody has an immortal soul. Um, does the Bible say that? No. And so when you begin to doubt the word of God, what happens? That's where the fall started. Just doubting the word of God. Just a little bit. That caused the fall. But remember, 18.4 of Ezekiel, the soul that sins, it shall die. How many have sinned? So we're all mortal. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.53, this mortal must put on immortality, meaning we don't have it. This is all not news to us, but to most of Christianity it is. Ecclesiastes 9.5, the dead know nothing. Isn't that interesting? Why do people go to the dead? They want to know something, don't they? <laughs> they go to the dead, and the dead know nothing. And so the devil, he knows something, and he tells them something too. Anyway, he breathes on them an unholy spirit. Now, in Job chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, as the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he that goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house nor shall his place know him anymore. Last one. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. It says, and I use the New King James for this because a lot of people don't know the words necromancer and things like that, but it means the same as this. There shall not be found among you one who practices witchcraft or a sorcerer or a medium. A what? Or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead. That's a necromancer in the King James. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. Now notice he doesn't say all these things they do are an abomination, but all that do these things. So when we get involved with these things, we put ourselves in a relationship with God that you don't want. An abominable. Remember, he who turns his ears from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. So what was happening with Christianity? Who is falling into this spiritualism thing? Okay. All right, <clears throat> so again, there was a worldwide uh, explosion of spiritualistic activity that started taking place, and the tables turned for mediums. And not only was there rapping that was taking place, but again, they called it table turning. Yeah, there were things that were levitating, that were lifting up. There were uh, actual manifestations of different beings that started to come out, uh, ectoplasm, different things started coming out of their different orifices, their ears, their nose, their mouth and it would solidify. Now, we say, oh no, you're watching too many sci-fi movies. We'll see what the Lord says about it. Okay, uh, spiritualism multiplies right along with Satan's power. In um, Signs of the Times, 6, 21, 83, therefore Satan, working now with tenfold greater power, succeeds as of old in blinding the eyes of men and darkening their understanding. There was a spiritualist medium named D.D. Hume. This man used to do things in broad daylight. He would have people over, several different companies a day would come and watch what this guy would do. Instead of doing it in a dark room behind curtains and everything, he'd do it in the daylight. This man was able to levitate out one window, a third floor window, and back in another window of another room. Okay, his name, it's, uh, it's spelled H-O-M-E, but uh, it's pronounced Hume. But uh, here's a picture of things that were happening in there. Uh, not just the table lifting up, but all kinds of furniture in the house was levitating and stacking up on itself. Now, they were trying to prove that this is real. This is real. And it was gathering a lot of attention. A lot of attention. 
Great Controversy 558. Through the agency of spiritualism, many undeniable wonders will be wrought. Therefore, Satan working now with tenfold, we already read that quote, okay? Undeniable wonders. Now, something we need to remember as Christians, when Satan comes using his masterpiece of deception, spiritualism, and we start seeing things like this happening and beyond, we need to remember that Satan has the power to do these things. And when did he do it first? Okay, materializing, levitation, or other spiritual manifestations, are they all trickery? Who, now, we, we know that. Thank you, sister. You know it, too. In Matthew uh, chapter 4, who was the first one the devil was doing that on that we read in the Bible in a really big way? If he could pick up Jesus, Matthew 5, verses uh, 4, verses 5 and 8, then the devil taketh him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. So, is levitation possible? It surely is. When the devil really wants to fool somebody, he can do it. Um, then, verse four, uh, chapter 4 and verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Did he do it in his head and show him a TV show? Or is it just like the Bible said? One way or the other, we need to recognize the spiritual power that we're up against is not trickery. It's far more powerful than we ever imagined. And I'm not trying to glorify him. What I'm saying is we need to lean a lot closer to the Lord because we're living in the time when every single one of us is going to be tested by this. Every one of us. And especially with healings, miracle healings. Now, remember I mentioned to you the radio... Oh, I didn't say the radiometer. Um, there was a man named uh, Sir William Crookes. He was a well-known chemist of the time. He was the one that found two elements that are on the uh, atomic chart, thallium and helium. Okay, so this is no small timer in the world of science, but he was brought in to find out, to prove or disprove whether these things that were happening with these spiritualists were real or not. And so he especially wanted to check out this Mr. D.D. Hume here. And so what he did is uh, he developed this thing, a radiometer, and you can still get these things today. They react to light. When light, particles of light hit them, they begin to spin. But they also spin like crazy in the presence of a genuine medium. When a medium comes around them and spiritual manifestations take place, the radiometer goes off. Okay, and then also this little thing here. Um, I've got to read my notes here. Uh, what was it called? A spectrogram or spectro, spectronometer. But see, people were saying, well, what they're doing is hypnotism. They're just hypnotizing the people and making them believe that they saw all these things. And he's saying, okay, can you hypnotize a machine? These machines were showing that there were spiritual presences. There were presences that, that manifest in, like light does, or heat, thermal. Uh, uh, I'm losing my words here. But anyway, um, Crooks also, he built this little metal cage, put a lock over the top of it, put an accordion in it. D.D. D. Hume puts his hand over the table and begins to play No Place Like Home on the accordion. And he says that he got his power to do these things from the spirits. The spirits really do it through him. He's just a medium. He's just the channel through which these things happen. Undeniable. Sister White said many undeniable uh, things will happen. Okay? So again, when we see these things, how is it going to react on us? I've already seen some of this stuff. Not... A lot of this, but I mean, I've seen a couple of things happen when I was messing around with the wrong people in the wrong places. But again, uh, this man invented something called the cathode ray tube. Anybody heard of that? Okay, so he's behind the invention of uh, the, the elements that made television what it is. And through levitation, materialism, and ectoplasm, um, this is ectoplasm. It's, a, it's like a cloudy, liquidy, gaseous thing. It, it's, uh, it starts to form. And uh, this is a, a girl, Florence Cook, not to be confused with crooks, but she would go into a trance, and out of her body would come this ectoplasm, and this being would form. Uh, her name is Katie... Oh, I'm having trouble with my memory today. K 
Katie King. She said that she was the daughter of the buccaneer um, Captain Morgan. Okay, she manifested for about 30 years through this woman. But anyway, uh, sounds bizarre. Why am I talking about all this? Well, we'll find out here in just a minute. But uh, it was measured. When she came around, this thing started going off. Uh, the other thing started going off, but she began to communicate. And again, he wanted to find out, is this stuff real or is it not real? But again, he was looking into these things and towards the end of his life, he developed something that he called a residual ectometron. What he was trying to do is invent a way, an electronic way, to channel the spirit world, to channel the spirits in and contain them. Now we say, ah -ha, doo -doo 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 -doo. uh uh. I, I'm, I want to suggest to you that. Maybe they have done something, but maybe it's not exactly what we're thinking and maybe not exactly what William Crooks was thinking. But the thing that scares me is I'm beginning to think that the spirits have found a way to channel us. Know what I mean? What happened? Go ahead. You know, it's funny, Dean, we, we're talking about that thing. So the thing in the box. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, uh, Brother Louie's got something to say. For those of us who used to watch movies years ago, uh, you remember Ghostbusters. They used to take all those ghosts and put them inside right. a container. They used to call it something similar to that. Okay, um, and what I want to share with you is all the uh, electronics geniuses, engineers, every single one of them was working on a device to open up a window or a doorway to the spirit world. Every single one of them. And that's what I want to get into. I want to show you how there isn't a single one of the inventions that we have, including these, that aren't infected with the things that they were doing. But what I'd like to share with you today is, uh, I want to ask you a question, and we're going to look at it again. With everything that you think and do, is it colored by the God that you worship, the spirit of the God that you worship? Whether we eat, whether we drink, or whatsoever we do, we do it all to the glory of God, by God's grace, right? I want to suggest to you that the inventions and the intentions mean a lot in regard to the fruitions, okay? And every one of the electronics engineers, every single one of them, I'm going to show you as we develop this message a little bit more, were all deep spiritualists. Okay? Um, my watch fell off, so I don't know how much time I have. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, let's get into it. All right. Now, the Bible says, <clears throat> be not deceived in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. We'll read 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners, except or good morals, except for Christians, right? We like to think we're immune. Evil communications do what? How about evil inventions of communication? Do you think possibly? Okay. And um, all right, so let's look at it. Things starting to move now. Uh, 1876, to improve on Morse code, Alexander Graham Bell invented and patented the telephone. And later on, he invented something I like to call the helophone. But uh, his brothers and he made a pact, especially with one of them. I don't remember his name. He had two brothers. Both of them died of tuberculosis. He made a pact with them that if one of us dies before the other, you will make communication with me, and hopefully through this device. Okay, so what he was trying to do, though, um, is use the technology and the wires that were already there that Morse's, you know, invention made and use that to spread the voices. But he also was a spiritualist, and he was hearing other voices. Now, the telephone has evolved. Let's look at a few of those things, and then pretty soon they're going to find a way to put a pay meter on it. But anyway, it's evolved, and um, he intended to build something that he calls the spirit phone. Uh, maybe he never developed it. Let's move on a little bit further. 1877, Thomas Alva Edison. Everybody knows who Edison is, right? This is one of the most ingenious men 
Um, some people say he stole a lot of ideas, but I'll tell you what, he sure stole a, <laughs> the right ones. But he held the world's record of 1,093 patents for inventions. So this is a thinking man. Where do you get all his ideas? Now, we know him best for the phonograph and the light bulb, okay? Now, the phonograph, he started out, Mary had a little lamb, remember? If you've ever seen anything about or heard anything about what he said. But he wanted to invent something. He was a spiritualist, and I'll show you how deep he was here in a minute. He wanted to invent something so sensitive. He knew that since he could register the human voice on wax, that maybe, thinking like Crooks was, that you could register the sound of spirits in their presence, in your presence. So he was really working hard on that. Now, anybody heard of this little woman here? Madame Blavatsky? Okay, I think a lot of you probably have heard of her. She was uh, the, the beginner of the Theosophist movement. Well, Lucifer really was. But anyway, he was using her. And I added these pictures. The magazine actually was this without these pictures. But uh, I put Graham Bell here and the Theosophy um, symbol. But this is in the Theosophist magazine of May 1889 to September 1889. And she, by the way, says Lucifer is God. And everybody that subscribes to the Theosophy believes that Lucifer is God, that he was the good one, that Jehovah was the evil one. Okay? Um, and there are also Rosicrucians, if you've heard of them. Okay, one of the latest items of mail news uh, states that Mr. Edison has joined the Theosophist. Now, this is Madame Blavatsky writing this. We may mention that Mr. Edison has been a Theosophist for a long time. The Mirror, that was the name of the newspaper in India, is right. Mr. Edison, the most remarkable inventor of our time, joined the Theosophical Society in April 1878. He signed, his signed obligation form hangs framed hangs on the wall of the secretary's office of the Adar headquarters. He had in mind at that time an idea of the mechanical application of a force, now listen to this please, which if ever released will be regarded as his greatest discovery. We are not at liberty to say any more. Well he said it himself a little later on. October 1920 in the American Magazine. I have been at work for some time building an apparatus to see if it's possible for personalities which have left this earth to communicate with us, Thomas Edison, and the device he called the spirit catcher. It would record changes in, in uh, thermal changes, changes of light, changes of sound, and he wanted to be able to, again, channel and contain, for whatever use, the spirits of the other side. Do you think a devil might want to do that? Yeah? You think so? So do I. So do I. But let's have a second witness from the Scientific American. I have been thinking for some time of a machine. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is a similar one. I have been thinking of some time of a machine or apparatus which could be operated by personalities which have passed on to another existence or sphere. Is this a man that could be approached by the devil very easily? Just like Eve, when she began to doubt that we would surely die. Okay? So the spirit catcher. And uh, you can find, if you research this, you look this up online, you'll find uh, a three-page article from, uh, it's either the American or Scientific American, the thing that he made that was quite an embarrassment to him because he couldn't catch the spirit. But I believe that these inventions that they invent may have hidden things in them that they themselves don't even know. Remember, the wicked shall go on doing wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. I have a feeling they have ways of communicating with us that we don't really see and feel outwardly. But anyway, <clears throat> I want to just look at the uh, a short evolution of the phonograph and where it's gone since then. Okay, though not overtly a classic tool for mediums, the phonograph may still open channels to impress our minds with messages. Uh, the jukebox, is that known for people who are connected with God? Now, juke means wicked, the wicked box, okay? A juke joint, okay, that's where that comes from. And now when you, you see people using the, the phonograph, they're using it for hip-hop and rap and this other stuff, 
Uh, are the people affected by God, does it look like, or do they seem like they're more affected by Satan? Kind of looks clean to me, clean and clear, that, uh, well, by their fruits you shall know them. Um, Backmasking? How's that worked out? Okay, let's move on. Roy Stimmen wrote a, a, a book called Spirit Communication, and now we're going to deal with radio. Okay, um, at the end of the 19th century, when Guglielmo, uh, how do you spell his name? Guglielmo, Guglielmo Marconi was experimenting with the first radio signals. He was shocked when he started to receive signals. Imagine that. Started hearing things talking to him when he was making the radio. Nobody else had a radio yet. So, what did he conclude? Marconi concluded that these were from the spirit world. That's not a bad thought, is it? You might kind of conclude that yourself, wouldn't you? I would. Now, moving on, he spent his last years trying to perfect an electronic device that would establish a permanent contact between this world and the next. So far, does it look like all of them? I'm trying to figure out when I should shift gears. I'm going to go on to this next inventor, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring it down, and uh, we'll come back for the 11 o'clock service. Now, I asked, can spirits ride the, ra the radio waves? Now, again, he was shocked when he started getting signals, but there's a guy named Carlos Santana. Um, <clears throat> His name can be uh, mixed up like uh, <laughs> Santa Claus too, right? But anyway, Satan. Anyway, he said this in the Rolling Stone, summer of 99. We want to, and this is a spirit that he communicates with quite often named Metatron. He says, we want to hook you back to the radio airway frequency. Once you reach them, then we want you to present them a new menu. Let them know that they are multi-dimensional multi spirits. Present them with a new form of existence that trans transcends religion. Now, Jimi Hendrix said that he used to hook up to this radio wave, too, and that's where he got his music. There are several different musicians that have talked about making this connection, and they connected into the spirit world, and they would do things like automatic writing, except they would do automatic music, automatic songwriting. Um, some of the people that were involved with television uh, and movie acting, they also are connected into this kind of thing, and they get their, their scripts for movies, a lot of different things. Now, to us, this sounds all wild and, and crazy and out of this world, and it kind of is, but it, there's a lot of people that this is everyday life. And some of them can be reached. It's very difficult. In medical ministry, page 89, it shows that the ones who can be reached, it says that their minds can never freely expand to the truth. But I still see hope in that. It's a battle and a march for who? All of us. So maybe their minds cannot freely expand to the truth, but with God's help, it still can. That's why I have hope. <laughs> How about you? Okay. So now remember, Carlos Santana, he was big in the 60s and early 70s, and he kind of faded away. And then he came back out with an album that some of you may know of, and I hope you don't, but maybe you might. It was called Supernatural. And uh, he made a big splash when he came back in, a real big splash. And everybody that got onto that album, they all said that they were communicated with by a spirit that told them to connect back up with Carlos Santana. And things happened. So the people that are in the music world are really connected. Um, okay, I'm going to bring it down to this one. This one we all know pretty well. Um, in 1926, uh, John Logie Baird invents the medium of television and channels of communication in new directions. In the 1920s through the 30s, Baird developed phonovision. Now we, we see video disc, but have you ever heard of planned obsolescence? Planned obsolescence. There's technology out there that is exponentially way beyond what we're buying right now. It's already been developed a long time ago. But they're just letting out little bits of it, little bits of it, little bits of it, so that we in the, in the consumer market are way, way, way behind what there actually is. So anyway, every now and then they release the next new thing, and we dig deep into our pockets, and we have to go get it. 
Okay? Oh, the better camera, the better computer, the better cell phone, the better this, the better that. And this stuff's been around for a long time. But we're just being strung along like a carrot in front of a horse. But anyway, uh, moving back to this, in the 1930s, Baird developed Phonovision, a system for recording the images on disk. By the 1940s, he was able to demonstrate large screen color and stereoscopic television. Now, this is the first image that he did through this. It was actually a mechanical electronic device. Okay, but he was able to produce uh, pictures. Now, um, isn't it interesting that what we call this form of communication, we call it media? Huh. Channeling? Let's change the channel. Okay, let's change it for a second. John Logie Baird also claims that he channeled Thomas Edison at a seance. Okay, so when you get into Oliver Lodge, and uh, I can't remember the one that wrote... Uh, uh, what's that cop's name? Sherlock Holmes. I forgot the guy's name that, that wrote all those books. Uh, uh, yeah, Arthur Conan Doyle. I mean, all of these men were involved with electronics communications, but they were also involved with spiritual communications. Everybody. Everybody. And I think I'm going to break it with this. But uh, I want to keep it in mind. Now, with all these uh, different inventions, you know, uh, Thomas Edison, uh, Spirit Catcher, uh, Bell and his telephone, and uh, television, <laughs> I guess you want to call it. Hey, how has TV worked out for us? Think it's brought more people closer to God than it has to separate them? I think... have hidden agendas in them. Yeah. If they don't tell you to go out and seek the Lord and do his favor, you know, watch them because some of them will say, send me money and the Lord will, no. That's, you know, you got to watch that TV set and all the rest of it. Turn it off completely. You it know what I'd like to... be my main function. I come in that house, turn it on. Not anymore, you see, because I'm, it, everything you're saying is the truth there. It's coming to us through yeah. that TV set. Okay, I'm going to break now, um, but I, I want to get back into that very point. And one thing that uh, I started out with, intentions have a lot to do with fruitions. But some of the things that you get involved with, some things, can I use white witchcraft to bring about a good end? I can't, can I? Okay, so what I want to suggest to you that everything that we do is colored by the God that we worship. If we worship the God that says, surely thou shalt not die, come here, I'm going to connect you up with the other world. Do you think maybe their inventions might be colored? Do you think maybe there might be something hidden in there that might even get through, even if you don't mean it to? This is what I want to share with you um, towards the end of it. Yes, uh, you know, some of you are going to watch this on a DVD. Not everything is evil. But what I want to share with you, there is a new technology that's come in that's made it exceedingly dangerous to do it, even watching what you think are the right channels. So I just want to let you be warned, brothers and sisters, because I want out of here. And the only way we're going to get out of here is if there's 144,000, whether you think that's a spiritual or a literal number, there's got to be some people prepared to meet the Lord in peace when he comes. And they need to be busy at work sharing the everlasting gospel, preparing other people to meet the Lord in peace when he comes. And I want to share the next part you'll see that it's going to become harder and harder to do that. But where sin abounds, what happens? Okay, for those who can get hold of the arm of omnipotence, Grace will abound. So let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we know that Satan has overt agendas and he has secret agendas, but we know for certain that it isn't going to be anything to do with the truth. It may have just enough around it to wrap up and hide the hook. But Lord, I just would like to ask you to please help us as we continue on with this, uh, this subject 
to discover what that hook is. And Lord, if our eye offends us or if our arm offends us, help us to know how to cut it off and cast it out. But Lord, we need to be about your business. And many of us are being hypnotized. And I think we could have been out of here a long time ago. Your, your servant said we could have. And now with all these inventions that we should be able to get around the world in minutes. But yet we're still here. Lord, help us. I think we're using the wrong methods. We need you. We need you in a, in a more powerful way than ever before. Please come into us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.